uh, don't normally have pogo stick scriptures, but we're going to be all over the Bible this morning. So don't get a paper cut. We will be going all over the place today, but that is good. So let us be attentive. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to, him, he said to them, so who, but who do you say that I am. And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. The flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my ecclesia. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. It's the word of God for us, the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. As we jump back into our sermon series on reading between the lines, our current word is church. And this is one of the harder words. The last one, fellowship, sharing all things in common, is kind of an easier thing to wrap your head around. Sure, we'll share things. Yes, there's business language. Our German friends are the ones responsible for our Kleenex problem which is aptly displayed. We've said church so much in our lives that we've created the idea of, like, we know what this thing is, but what is it? And trying to get people to describe what church is is very, very difficult. Church is that place where everybody fights. Church is that place where they take money. Church is that place where we go where we sit and we don't do anything for like an hour and then we go eat. Church is a lot of things for a lot of people. The Germans came up with this translation, and it's kind of struggled since because it's not really an easy word to, to come up with. So they came up with a word that didn't exist, which is even worse because when you come up with a word that doesn't exist, you get to define what that word means. And over time, those things start separating. The original intent of what an ecclesia was and what we're supposed to do with it. My colleagues and I joke all the time that if John Wesley were to come back, he would go, what is this? And we would go, it's church. And he would go, what is this? Because I don't think that's what he had in mind. I don't think what we do most often, and especially North America, is what Jesus might have had in mind. So what did he have in mind? Come on, clicky. There we go. All right, so Caesarea Philippi. It's important to know where Jesus is. Out of all the pieces of Scripture we have, this is the most location-relevant piece of Scripture where Jesus and location are entangled so tightly that you cannot separate where Jesus is from what he's saying. So Caesarea Philippi is about 120 miles from Jerusalem and about 20 miles from the Sea of Galilee. He walked a long way to get there. This isn't like, let me go to the corner store for milk. They walked 20 miles, at least 20 miles, for him to stand at a particular place to have a conversation. It's where Mount Hermon is today. It's the beginning of the Jordan River. Remember that place where he was baptized? That thing. This is the source of the Jordan River. It comes from the, the swell of the mountain, so during the wintertime it freezes, and during the springtime, just like the Colorado River with the wonderful commercials that the water's so fresh and clean, it comes out of this cave and goes all the way downhill. This is the source of most of people's life and water in that region. It's also the red light district. 
So it's an interesting spot because this is where they have a wonderful God that they, uh, let's just say the red light district is the highlight of the particular life in this community. And part of how that life came to be about is that there were people and those people through certain acts can become gods. And so that's what the rhythm of life in this particular thing is. You get to participate in community life, you participate in the red light district, and you too can become a god. You move from mortal to immortal. And some people would call that H-E double hockey sticks, or Hades, which is the other word that people would describe it. So we're really clear because Jesus is standing there to make the first point. The first point is, Jesus is not a man who turned into a god. That's the line of questioning that's so important. Some say you're this guy. Some say you're this guy. Some say you're this guy. And he's standing right at the cave, which is in front of a huge, huge mountain. So the ecclesia, the ecclesia actually meets at this particular spot. There's going to be a slide later, apparently, right before. Eh, it doesn't matter. We'll show the slide later. All right, so you have the cave, and then you have a temple right next to the cave. And next to that, you have an outdoor meeting space. And next to that, you got another temple and another temple. This is where people hung out. And so what is the ecclesia? Well, the ecclesia would mean called out. You were to stop your daily life, and you were to come and gather the ones who were called out. The ecclesia would be a spot where people would stop in their day or perhaps take a whole day, and they would gather in this meeting space at the end of the cave and next to all of the places of worship, and they would have discussions. You could call it an assembly. A gathering of people. And the Greeks actually were some of the most brilliant politicians that we have stolen from. And if you can think of our current democratic system as I go describe what this ecclesia is, you will see how much the Greeks actually influenced our own republic. What we do. A lot of the principles behind that American flag, that hand out front, come from the ecclesia. It was revolutionary at the time. Because remember, you had kings, you had chieftains, and the Greeks said, well, what if we let the people have conversations to decide what happens? Whoa. Not one person? No. Let, let's, let's have an assembly of people. So this started in 600 BC, having conversations. It's an ancient way of gathering. All could participate regardless of class. You could be rich. Or you could be poor. You could participate. The Romans had a very different system. The Romans had serious class. You were a senator, and you were rich, and then you bought your way into the Senate. The common folk didn't have a word or a space. Jesus was alive during this time. He could have compared what he wanted to the Roman model, which everyone knew, which is also where they were underneath the Roman rule. He could have compared what he wanted to do with the Roman setup, but he didn't. That's the interesting part. Anyone could talk. Now, folks who were the oldest got first pick. Those of us who are younger talk too much. We're also not as wise. So they valued wisdom. They valued people's opinions. It's also why there was no time limit to these assemblies. They could go on for a long time. This is one of the coolest parts. They wanted the poor to participate. The working class. The only way the working class could participate is if you what? Paid them to leave work. Because if you want somebody to participate in something and they have to choose between putting bread on the table and feeding their families or participating in the assembly, people are going to feed their families. And so for people who couldn't afford to take the day off of work, 
they would give them a stipend and pay them for their service. Kind of like jury duty, except you really don't get paid much for jury duty, but there's the principle behind it. To participate in public activities, we will give you a stipend. We'll also not throw you in jail, but that's a whole other you know, aspect to the agreement. Meeting three to four times a month. I see you guys every Sunday. Well, it kind of works out that way. We don't exactly have 6,000 people on a Sunday. Hope for the future. But you would have a massive amount of people that would show up. The idea was engagement. It's a word we don't use a whole lot in our ecclesia, our church community. But they would have conversations about whether or not the community could be sustainable. You want to know who the number one person that was kicked out of the community was kicked out for? It wasn't crime. It wasn't theft. It wasn't because you were a bully. The most often kicked out a person from the community was the one that gained either too much power or too much wealth. If you gained too much influence and you had way too much power over the rest of everyone there, they booted you from the community. Because you weren't living in community. You were trying to take it over. You were trying to be a king. It was a very interesting practice. It's one of the few cultures in the entire world that would boot out people that acquired too much. Very fascinating. It's one of my other favorite things. So they would have a lottery system. Now, because it was run by humans, it really wasn't a total lottery system. It was mostly a lottery system. The lottery system also prevented the establishment of a permanent class of civil servants. Some of you might know this about our government. OK, who might be tempted to use the government to advance or enrich themselves or get too comfortable being in power. And so what they would do is to decide who is going to be in the upper committee, which would kind of run the town. So the ecclesia would all gather, but there would be kind of like your folks that would be in charge of the treasure, just like we go vote for people. Well, instead of voting, they didn't want people to buy the seats. So what they did was they would put names in a hat, and then they'd pull people. You're going to be the treasurer. They'd pull people. You're going to be. And then they would have other people hold that person accountable and or wait for it, help them do their job. Help train them. Maybe you're not good with numbers. Let's get five people that were good with numbers, and they will help you do your job. But you're the one who's in charge. And they would do this. Did it all work well? No. The funny part is <laughs> we looked at the records over centuries. By we, I mean like other people, and then I read what they did. the rich and powerful statistically had better odds. I wonder how that happened, okay? So it wasn't perfect. There were some people that got shifted in there. But you get the idea of what they were trying to do. It's a fascinating thing. This is what the ecclesia would do. They would open with worship. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? We have a, wait for it, hold on. Call to worship. OK, cool. So we have a call to worship. They would sing songs. Wait, um, uh, make a channel of your peace. Sing songs. Well, they would have petitions and prayer. Wait a minute. I didn't copy this. This is literally their liturgy. OK, so we'd have prayer. We'd have an offering. And then we'd have a discussion. gathering of the people would gather to discuss the lives that each one of them were living through their unique perspective. Hey, we got a, uh, a sewer leak over on uh, 4th Street. I don't know what it was called. And they would all gather and go, yeah, we should do something about that. Who thinks we should get Bobby's crew over down to go fix the sewer leak on whatever? Everybody vote. All right, everybody say hi. There's no Robert Rules of Order, but somebody seconded it, and then they moved on. That was 
That was Sunday. That'd be really weird. Weird for us if we gathered on a Sunday and opened up with prayer and then had a discussion about, hey, did y'all hear that we had like some weird shooting down on the corner and such and such thing and we sat around and discussed it on a Sunday morning? That'd be weird for us. Because we've got people who do that, right? We've got people who do that. We've got people who do that. We have a committee who does that. Remember, we talked about this. Any two or more are gathered. Are gathered in my name, I am present. So we already have this gathering that's set up. These folks gather on a weekly basis in large and small communities. So even at Caesarea Philippi, there's an ecclesia. There's one in Athens. The one in Athens was huge. Every week, like 10,000 people would show up. Because who doesn't like to get paid to show up to a meeting and eat? That's fine. In smaller communities, such as Cheviot, your mayor may also be your judge, may also be your, you know, those small town things. They would all gather, and they would be a little bit more engaged. It's not like there's 5, 10, 20 people that are going to do the job. People would gather around and go, hey, this guy's out of fertilizer. Who's got fertilizer? Does somebody need sugar? Remember that whole thing? Let me knock next door and see if somebody's got sugar. That's what would happen. It would take care of one another. So how do we know this? Ready? Here's our cave. There's our temple. There's our court. And that's where they would gather, at the court of Pan. That outside little deal there, because who wants to be inside with smelly people who haven't showered in a week? So we're going to gather outside. First Thessalonians. That's where we're going to jump. Paul, Sevilius, and Timothy to the Ecclesia of the Thessalonians. So, the Ecclesia could be translated as such. The civic organization that gathers on a weekly basis, that opens up in worship, that takes an offering, that keeps in mind its fellow human beings that are inside of a particular municipality of Thessalonia, that now meets in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. This is the opening line of Thessalonians. All right, let's go to 2 Thessalonians. Paul Sevilius and Timothy to the civic organization that's already gathering weekly that opens up in worship, that also gathers with the mindfulness of the entire community that takes up offerings for the betterment of everyone else of Thessalonia, who now meets in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a theme here. Galatians. Paul the Apostle, sent neither by human commission nor from the human authorities, but through Jesus Christ, God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And to the members of God's family who are with me, to the civic organizations. Organizations, there's several in Galatia. There's not one. To all the small towns who gather and meet with the betterment of society in your minds of Galatia. I greet you. Oh wait, Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, to the saints and the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in Colossae, grace and peace be to you. Our prayers are with you. Always thank God, the Father, and Lord Jesus Christ. What are we missing there? Colossae didn't have an ecclesia. It's an interesting question whether or not the ecclesia in Colossae decided to follow and become members of the church. It's a notable exclusion. Paul's greeting Christians in Colossae that aren't a part of the ecclesia. In all these other municipalities, essentially what happened was they switched from having the God of Pan or the God of whatever, and they took what they were doing that gathered every week and they said, we're now going to gather in the name of Jesus Christ and we're going to continue to make a difference in our community. But we're now going to do it in the name of Jesus Christ. It was the most brilliant piece of recruitment that has ever happened in the history of anything. Paul took all these people who were already gathering 
and said, you guys are doing good stuff. But let me tell you what Jesus can do on top of what you're doing. What happens if you use the gifts and talents of the resurrected Christ to be even better than what you're doing? 1 Corinthians, Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother, I'm not even going to try that one. To the civic organization that gathers in worship for the betterment of the community of God that is in Corinth. To those who are sanctified in Jesus Christ, called to be saints. I can keep doing this. I'll let you keep reading. Every single letter of Paul. Every single letter. Anybody know who this guy is? Yes? Yeah, we know who he is? He hasn't been on TV in a while. But now he's streaming. He's got car shows and what have you. I don't think he's that funny. I think he's a really good businessman. Who also made a real living during the politic era of uh, Clinton's fun times. I have a lot of respect for Jay Leto. Jay Leto was making oh, $30 million a year to host the show. $30 million a year. And they had a budget issue at NBC. And they came to him and they said, look, we're going to have to cut half your staff. And he goes, half my staff? Why? Well, advertisers aren't paying as much. We're having an economic yada yada. You need to cut half your staff. So he went home and he went back to his office and he's like, I make $30 million. And so he found out how much he needed to save his staff. He needed $15 million to save his staff. So he called a staff meeting together and he said, all right, look. I've got two options. I either make $30 million and half of you go home, or I make $15 million and all of you stay. You get to vote. And as he tells the story to this day, he goes, I was outvoted. That's the ecclesia. That's the ecclesia. Sometimes you see this in a player's contract. Some of you know this quite well because our local young man has been given quite a contract. There will be a time, because things change in the NFL, and it's one of the things that made some of the best quarterbacks of all time even better. They sign a contract today, but perhaps in the near future, there'll be a certain Jamar Chase that is also going to want a contract. And there will be, from time to time, the team's star player go, look, redo my contract so we can keep this guy with me. You find that in teams that stay together and do well. Not a big fan of the Patriots because they keep winning, but Brady did that almost every year to make sure that they could keep some of their better players. It's a hard thing to think about church being something more than what we do on Sunday. To make decisions or to vote or to sacrifice so somebody else wins. For other people to benefit, potentially at our expense. That's not American, by the way. The American ideal is you work hard, you get what you can get, and you deserve it. And you do. Jesus called Peter to build an ecclesia. Upon this principle, this foundation, I want to build my organization that gathers weekly, that opens up in prayer, that gives offering, that looks after the poor that doesn't gather for its own wealth or being, but gathers for the betterment of the community and the light of the world. I pray that we can become that in small and large ways.
No, I don't want to form our own police departments. No, I don't want a commune. Yes, we have to work with our fellow civic leaders. I give Dick a lot of credit. He's working with our fellow civic people so we can put three doors in. But I will tell you and I will share with you that the way people are treated here as all of these construction projects are happening has made people pause and have conversations. I joked with Charlie this week. I said, Charlie, I'm sorry I didn't call you for lunch this week. I said, I didn't even eat lunch four out of the five days. <laughs> because people want to know what we're doing here. And why would you do this? And what is this for? I would like to tell people we're not interested in being a church. We're more interested in being an ecclesia, where the community benefits far more than we do. And we can be a part of telling the world that we're just not a civic organization that does nice things, that we meet in the name of Jesus Christ, to use our gifts and talents and our resources to make the world a better place. And we're doing the best we can. And through God's grace, we will continue to do that work. Let us pray. Lord God, I thank you. I thank you for the gift of people who showed us how to be the ecclesia. I thank you for the giants that have done many good things in this church, in this place. Help guide us. Help use us. Use our gifts, our talents, our resources that we can be a part of of a gathering, an assembly of people who want to make a difference in the world. Help us to gather in your name. Use us. Use our gifts, use our talents, use our wealth, use our resources, use all of us, Lord God, and we can make the world a better place. I thank you and praise you. And all God's people we say, amen.